Houston Station, we're ready for the event. Associated Press, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear from the International Space Station. Well, uh, Mike, Jeanette, it's a pleasure to talk with you both today from the Kennedy Space Center. Um, you've got important guests coming next week, the first Starliner crew. What, if any, extra precautions are you taking ahead of the docking since this is the first time Star Starliner is arriving on your doorstep with passengers? Well, the first precautions are to kid-proof the station because Butch and Sonny are our really good friends and we kind of know their behavior. Uh, but uh, all seriously, uh, you know, it, the arrival of a brand new vehicle, the first crewed flight of a new generation spacecraft is a really big deal. You leave nothing to chance. So, uh, in fact, we just finished a conference uh, on our, our training schedule for it. We're going to be going over every detail involved in the rendezvous approach docking uh, and uh, every little nook and cranny of uh, possibilities that we need to look at. So they're basically the same procedures and precautions we would take with any vehicle, except uh, the excitement ratchets up a little bit because it's a brand new vehicle. Is, is there anything that you could do to help um, uh, Sonny or Butch um, if things don't go exactly as planned uh, during the rendezvous, or is it pretty much all in their hands? Well, to be sure, uh, it, it is in their hands as the uh, vehicle commander and pilot, but uh, of course there's a lot of other hands uh, standing watch as well. Uh, those in Mission Control, uh, the Boeing team, which is built and uh, services spacecraft, there'll be a lot of people watching. We'll be monitoring the approach, of course, and uh, getting a little bit more involved as they get a little closer, uh, but this is an autonomous vehicle fully capable of free flight, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing that demonstrated. Well, uh, do you have your welcoming party all figured out yet? What 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 are you going to do for the big occasion? Well, whenever any crew arrives, you know the crew that's on board usually help prepare the station for their arrival. That means getting their sleeping quarters, their sleeping bag ready. Um, even looking for some of their items, personal items that may have come up early. So we're really just going to try to make it more welcoming as they aboard, as they come on aboard. Uh, well, Jeanette, um, I have another question for you. What is the most thrilling thing you've discovered about living in space so far? And I'm assuming it was worth the long wait, but you tell me. It was definitely worth the long wait. Um, there's so many things that um, wowed me. Uh, you know, when I saw it, wow, that's all I could think. And just the feeling of being weightless in space, this whole feeling. <laughs> and, you know, this was, this was the biggest wow. You just kind of float, and it's, it's natural in space. It becomes natural, I should say. But the biggest thing for me was seeing the planet from this vantage point. It's absolutely um, breathtaking. And it's, um, it's beauty its position in space, um, the blackness around it, all of it will just, you know, it, it just causes you to gasp and just say, wow, that's our home and there's nothing nearby. So we really have to take care of our planet. Well, it, 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 you know, I can't help but think about current events on Earth, and and it, the, the Earth must look so peaceful from space. If only you could, um, you know, I don't know, beam back that, that sense that you're talking about to the rest of us down here. Yeah, and just to reiterate, I think what most astronauts have said was that you don't see the lines dividing people um, from here, and it is just one planet. <laughs> and there's nothing um, extremely close by except our moon, so um, the impetus to take care of it when you see it is, is to me it's normal because yeah there's nothing like seeing our home from this vantage point uh, another question for both of you um, from a physiological point of view what is the best thing about spending months in weightlessness and what's the worst thing from your body's point of view Well, this is kind of my passion, Marsha, as you're probably aware, that the human 
in space, how we adapt to our capacity to change every system in the body to try to make us better for uh, being in this environment. And to me, one of the most amazing things is how effectively we become three-dimensional creatures. We totally unload ourselves and uh, we can navigate in three dimensions, up, down, sideways, and we keep an upright posture, mainly for the cameras, for the folks on the ground. But uh, for us, uh, you know, it's, it's totally natural just to do this and um, put ourselves in a position, <laughs> let me reset a bit, put ourselves in a position that works well for us uh, when we move to another work site. So the way we change, the way we move, the way we handle large masses totally changes while we're up here, and that's all part of that adaptation. We become very comfortable three-dimensional zero-gravity creatures, and it's amazing that we have the capacity to do that. I think, to me, that's the best thing. I'll let Jeanette maybe think about a worse thing. <laughs> The worst thing for me is that, you know, everything here floats. The dust, everything, we float. And for me, um, breathing in some of that stuff just because of it's like having seasonal allergies sometimes. And so that's to me, is probably the worst. But like on Earth, you deal with allergies, you take um, Claritin or something, and you're, you're fine. So it's not really the worst, but, you know, that's one of the things that I have to cope with. Uh, do you find yourself sneezing more than often up there, Jeanette, or what's that like? Not just um, sneezing, but uh, just a little bit more congestion because we also have a fluid shift in our body. So if you have an allergic reaction, you get the itchy and you get a uh, little bit of swelling, but you, you take your allergy medication and you're better. So. If that's the worst, then, you know, I deal with it on Earth, I can deal with it here. <laughs> um, what about your, from a psychological point of view, the best and the worst of months in weightlessness? Um, talk, talk a little bit about that now. Well, the psychological impact is that um, we are still really connected to the Earth through different means like we have um, teams that we can use we still have our email we have a phone that we can use to call people and we have other software that allows us to see and talk to our family and friends as often as we want so psychologically I think we're way better than we were even just a year ago with the tools that we have with staying connected to earth but on the other side, I like to remind myself that I'm in a unique environment and I only have a short amount of time here. So for me, staying in the present, enjoying what I have here and telling people about it, you know, I think that keeps me motivated and keep me going. So the motivation is high. Let me just add that one of Jeanette's superpowers is being able to effectively share this experience with others uh, down on the planet. And she does that regularly. And I, I think there's a big boost in being able to, to share this experience uh, for us personally as well. Um, well, you know, two of your Russian colleagues are in the midst of a one-year mission, right? How, what, what, you know, from where you guys float, um, how are the, the two uh, cosmonauts uh, doing um, with such a long mission? And could you ever envision yourself doing that um, by choice? Well, first of all, uh, Oleg uh, and Kolya are doing great. Uh, they were chosen for this experience for good reasons. They're both very professional, well-mannered, and just a lot of fun. We have an excellent relationship with these guys. We see each other every day. We talk frequently. Psychologically, physically, they're, they're both very strong. I would also point out that Oleg Karanenko, who I've known for a couple of decades now, uh, is also the records holder. Uh, for the cumulative time and space. So he knew exactly what he was getting into. And, you know, he's, he's flourishing up here just fine. As far as uh, my own personal choice, I actually was willing to spend a year up here as well. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see how we adapt. The adaptation happens over a period of, of several weeks, and that gives way to endurance. And uh, that's a whole different chapter in things. And six months goes by in the blink of an eye, uh, but I would love to see what happens beyond six months at some point. Well, is NASA going to take you up on your offer? And should NASA be flying more one-year astronauts um, like the Russians do on occasion? What's your thought on that, uh, Mike? 
Well, I, I wish it was up to the individual to just say, hey, I'm ready to fly, uh, book me on the next flight. It's not. Uh, but uh, we have certainly been willing to fly people under various circumstances, planned and otherwise, for a year. We can do it. Our food habitability countermeasure systems are very good right now, and we can do it with a, a fair degree of confidence. As far as uh, should we, you know, we're accumulating the experience we need. We share data with our Russian colleagues, uh, and I think we will have a pretty informed database of what happens to people when they fly for a year, which will serve us very well when we want to uh, break orbit and head to Mars for these uh, potentially multi-year missions. So I think uh, we are developing that experience base organically, and it's paying us forward. Uh, well, another question for you, Mike. Is a repeat space station flyer, how is your body doing this time, better or worse than your previous missions? And do you think age is a factor at all in how it's adjusting up there? And also a belated happy birthday, by the way. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I, I had uh, a, a pretty amazing birthday celebration. It seemed to last for a few days. So I will say personally that I actually adapted quicker uh, during this time. Now, how much of that, even though there was a, a 11 or 12 year gap between the flights, uh, how much of that is cognitive strategies versus what's innately remembered by the body? Uh, that's up to debate, I'm not sure. But uh, I felt very comfortable very quickly up here just uh, both handling the fluid shift and some of the other changes and being able to navigate in three dimensions and, and handle things and not lose stuff. So uh, I, I would say that whatever factor age may have played, um, I, I did adapt more quickly, this being my third space flight. I know that uh, we've flown several people in their 60s. My colleague Don Pettit is going to ratchet that up, but I believe turns 70 uh, if all goes as scheduled. And uh, we find that if you are relatively healthy on the ground, you can navigate and get along pretty well up here. So um, I think that uh, we've expanded that age envelope considerably, and I think it's appropriate to do so. Oh, you know, for moon crews, um, when NASA is picking its moon landing crews, what other attributes, well, you know, all the astronauts we know are very well trained, they're all in good shape, you know, of sound mind, but what extra oomph might they need if they're going to be assigned to a moon landing mission? What do you two think about that? What kind of characteristics would you be looking for if you were picking a moon landing crew? And especially the first crew. Well, I think Mike has a lot more data on this, um, but and I, only thing I, I I can see is that you know, it's not necessarily the first time that we've been to the moon, but th it's been a long time. So they have a, they have to set the um, you know set the um, target and you know learn a bunch of new things and do all of these things for what seems like the first time. And being the first in anything is always tougher than the second person, third person, fourth person. But, you know, there's many other things that they're going to have to do, and I think Mike has a lot of those. Well, I, I don't have any more data than Dr. Epps does. Uh, she's being modest. But, uh, you know, just like with the Apollo era, uh, it'll be a small ship. It'll be a new ship. They're going to be doing things on the moon that have never been done before. Compared to what we have from a habitability standpoint, ample space, ad lib, and almost unlimited access to water and oxygen and consumables and food, it'll be a very austere environment, very uh, expeditionary, very exploration oriented. So they're going to have to be very single minded, very disciplined, and uh, very well trained to handle all these conditions, very similar to what we did in the Apollo uh, years. Are, are there any traits that come quickly to your mind that you would have at the top of your list if you were picking the first moon landing crew? What kind of traits would you be looking for? Well, I, I think I can honestly state that we bake those traits into selection now. So when you look at the astronaut office, you've pretty much got a group that organically has and expresses those traits. Uh, but you're, you're looking for people who are adaptable, uh, who can handle conditions that are less than pleasant, uh, who, who kind of expand their comfort zone rather than get uncomfortable out of their comfort zone. We try to train in ways uh, that challenge similarly. Uh, we will put people in austere environments where they're cold and wet and hungry and uncomfortable. Uh, and that, again, expands the comfort zone a little bit because that, 
will have some similarities to uh, the moon landing. And of course, uh, training as much as possible on, on the system. So I, I think um, the traits that we're looking for for moon landing are, are very much baked into the standard traits we expect of, of everybody in the astronaut office. It, it seems to me that, uh, I'm not sure, would you be looking for a, another Neil Armstrong type? I mean, he certainly was the cream of the crop um, among his peers, and, and history has proven that, you know, as we look back. Well, I'll add that, um, of course, we want those types like Neil Armstrong, but, you know, building the, the foundation and making it uh, just slightly broader, I think those, Mike's right, I think those characteristics are still um, within the folks in the office, you know, a fighter pilot. Um, we have... Um, research scientists, um, geologists. So a lot of um, these traits that expeditionary behavior, they're flexible, adaptable. Um, they understand that, you know, some of the analog missions that we do, you're under real threat of, you know, a risk for things happening. They're not analog missions where you know it's always going to be safe. So having that mindset of understanding that, performing under those conditions, and performing well and coming out on the other side fine and okay, understanding that you took a risk, that it was high threat, that you still survived it. Um, there's a lot of things to the mindset that comes along with it, but I think Mike's right. A lot of the things that we do, you those traits come out of every individual in the office who goes through those things. So I think we'll definitely have the Neil Armstrong types, um, and I think we'll add to that a little bit in the future. Yeah. Uh, and and on, on the op my last question on the opposite end of the spectrum, can just anybody in passable health um, of any age, you know, adult, um, could you see that anyone just coming up for a couple months, or regardless of you know, just an ordinary citizen? Do you think that's going to be farther down the road, or what's your take on just anybody coming on board? And since this is my last question, I'll say goodbye now and God speak to you both. Okay, well, it, it's a great question because it's actually being answered real time. As you know, the spaceflight population is expanding uh, both from a commercial standpoint and an international standpoint, even outside of the standard partnership that we've had with the International Space Station. So for the last few years, uh, and even more so these last uh, couple of years, we've been flying a lot of folks outside of the professional astronaut cadre, and, and for the most part, uh, they do very well. Uh, we're not quite safe enough or we don't quite know enough to open it up quite to everybody with a, a uh, standardized risk or keeping the same risk with everyone, but it's expanding rapidly and I expect that trend to continue. And that's an exciting thing for us. You know, NASA's charter is, is to explore, certainly, but part of that is to open the space frontier, not just to uh, keep it uh, to a, a really highly select group. And we've really welcomed and enjoyed having a spaceflight participants up here. So we expect that trend to continue. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much. Just both to add one little bit. Oh, yes, sorry. No, the big thing I was going to say was that we have thousands of applicants that apply to the astronaut corps, and who knows that a lot of those folks understand the risk. Maybe they have, have the same mindset outside of the corps as well. So we'll see in the future um, who applies and who wants to go to space. I think you'll find that they have a lot of the same traits. Well, thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Mike. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, got to be on the rest of your journey and uh, talk to you again soon. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.